Amanda, welcome back to the show. It's great to have you on. And um, I think we're going to be talking about some more topics in EMS pharmacology. And I think specifically looking at uh, medications dealing with anaphylaxis and specifically uh, epinephrine, because we see epi, um, sometimes there, you found some pretty big errors in the way epinephrine is put into protocols. Absolutely. And it's one of those medications that, depending on the concentration, the administration route, um, and the indication, it can be a very, it's a high alert medication, and we have to be very aware of what's appropriate or not, the doses that are appropriate for which indication, and, you know, patient condition changes, but we got to make sure we're doing it correctly according to the patient condition. So one thing that I've noticed going through several protocols in um, the Central Florida area is the allergic reaction second, section of the protocols. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There's a little too much reliance, it seems, on the adjunctive therapies. So if you have, you know, allergic reaction that is mild, um, the treatment is, you know, generally Benadryl, which is fine, diphenhydramine, or even some famotidine. Um, those are fine, but the only thing that treats a true anaphylactic reaction is epinephrine, and it should be always given IM. It can be given sub-Q, but preferably IM. It has to be the high concentration, the 1 in 1,000, and it should be given pretty quickly. So if you get to a scene and you see a patient and you assess them and they're having you know, chest tightness, wheezing, um, maybe they're having some blood pressure issues. Um, before you even start a line, you can give them some IM epi before you continue on because then you can get the line and give them the IV Benadryl and the steroids, famotidine. Those are all adjunctive to the epi. There's no real contraindication to epi in a true anaphylaxis reaction, which um, there seems to be some confusion on because there are drug interactions with epi as you'd expect there to be. But a beta, if I have a lot of older patients, more than likely they have cardiac issues, they're on beta blockers, they have uh, arrhythmias, past MI, but that doesn't mean you don't give them the IM epi. It's going to be more reluctant to treat, you're going to get more of the alpha properties of the epinephrine, but there will be a little override of the beta, and hopefully it'll open up those airways, because that's the number one cause of death in anaphylactic reaction is, you know, airway obstruction, whether it be upper or lower. And one of the reasons we want to focus on IM versus sub-Q, just to remind people, is that um, we faster onset um, when you go into IM uh, administration because of the more vascular tissue and you get it into the blood flow much faster that way. Absolutely. And epi is a very short-lived drug. It, it works immediately and very shortly. So you can repeat that IM epi, depending on the patient condition, every 5 to 15 minutes. Now, the... Um, the guidelines suggest that you only do it up to three times after that. Then they say you start a drip. And I don't mean putting a half a milligram in tandem L syringe and doing a slow IV push. I mean a drip. So you can throw one milligram into a 100 bag and run it from 5 to 15 micrograms per minute because that's the anaphylaxis dose. So you're getting a small amount of epi continuously to combat that um, allergic reaction process, that usually an IgE-mediated process. Um, in some of the studies, it's really interesting that one study found that within five minutes of reaction, they had cardiac arrest for the adrogenic reactions, within 15 minutes cardiac arrest of stinging, and 30 minutes with food. So, and in most of the patients, they weren't even given epi until later into their treatment. So we've gotten so used to using the Benadryl and the famotidine and the steroids, but those are adjunctive. They work later. They prevent, like the Benadryl is the itching. It kind of helps with the hives. And, uh, famotidine helps with GI tract reactions, but we need to focus on the immediate threat, and that's airway, and that needs to be with the FEIM to begin with. And you can get that line secondarily. The other thing is that there's usually a big fluid shift and can be up to 35%. So they may require large amounts of fluid just because they don't have it where they need it. Right. So right. for, I mean, adults, they say usually start with one to two liters. It can even go as high as seven depending on your patient. Because if you have, if you live in Florida, if you have a dehydrated patient who's now got an anaphylactic reaction, you've got a double whammy there. So you have to make sure to have some fluid on board before you move to those um, the epi drip. 
And there's also, when we were talking about beta blockers, they're resistant. So where that leads you to is to doing glucagon, which we don't generally like to use in patients because it causes a lot of nausea and vomiting, but it is cardiogenic, it's ionotropic, and it's good for that resistant anaphylaxis in patients specifically on beta blockers. So you need so to start thinking outside of the box when you've got like an elderly patient that is, is seems to be not responding quickly to the epinephrine, um, you know, rather than, you know, fool around with um, going, you know, trying to get that line. They're, they might be fluid depleted anyway, so the line's going to be harder to get. Start thinking about other things that may be going on with them to counteract um, that's suppressing your epinephrine. Right, right. And that's why I say if, if, if it's a moderate to severe reaction, and that's a problem. It's underdiagnosed. It's hard to treat. Usually there's multiple complaints for a patient. If you start with the IM, then you can move forward from there. You know, I know normally there's more than one person on the scene, but one person can work on the epi, the other one works on the line. Once you have the line, you can get the fluids, and then you can do the adjunctive medication. They're called adjunctive medications for a reason. It's because they're not the primary medication that's important. And it's not just uh, an EMS issue. I mean, it's shown in EDs and hospitals. Yeah. Throughout the whole medical system, we are afraid of epi when it comes to allergic reactions. So it's underdiagnosed, undertreated, and it's noted in the literature that when we don't use it, there's a higher rate of death due to delay or lack, entirely lack of use of epinephrine in the treatment. And I'll tell you that it, for anybody who's seen an allergic reaction progress, it happens very quickly. So if you have any suspicion at all that you have a patient that is more than just a mild reaction to something, you should consider the epi early in the process as the literature shows because if you, you want to get ahead of the process, you do not want to be trying to chase it, but chase it down when you have this progress to full-blown anaphylaxis. Um, you really want to get ahead of it and get that epi on board as early as possible. So if you see a patient that's starting to progress at all beyond a simple allergic reaction, um, then you need to really get into um, proactive treatment. Yeah, I mean for adults, yeah, in adults you go like 0 0.3 to 0 0.5 um, for the epi IM, and then for children it's usually 0 0.01 milligram per kilogram, but you want to not exceed the adult doses depending on the patient weight and age. Um, and then you can always repeat. Uh, everything else is secondary to epi when it comes to anaphylaxis. I mean, um, the, and the IV bolus thing is one thing that's really bothered me where they put it in a syringe and they treat it like a cardiac arrest. The current guidelines of the ACLS protocols have epi, IV push only for cardiac arrest. And I don't like when protocols say uh, cardiac arrest is imminent. What is eminent defined as? There's no definition. There's no criteria. So you're leaving up to the individual. So instead of saying we're going to wait until the last minute to go ahead and start using that epi aggressively. Hold on. That's okay. <laughs> okay. So let's pick up. I'll ask you a question about, um, let's see. Um, Let's talk, I'll, I'll ask you a question about imminent cardiac arrest, and we'll just pick up with that topic fresh. Now, Amanda, what about um, some protocols out there, in some places I've seen this, it actually will say that IV epinephrine is appropriate for imminent cardiac arrest and not just cardiac arrest by itself, which seems like a very vague um, diagnosis. Absolutely, it is vague. Um, there are specific criteria that you should be using the epi for, and imminent has, it just means you probably haven't been aggressive enough early enough. So if you're waiting to do IV push, we're used to doing that. They're going to go into ACLS, and they might throw them into cardiac arrest because now we're giving, we're stressing their heart even more, giving them epi IV push. We give it to try to restart the heart in cardiac arrest. So to give it IV push in a patient who's alert and oriented, most of the time, um, can just lead to more patient harm. That's actually the highest. Most ADEs, adverse drug events, occur when you're giving IV boluses of epi. Um, that's why this is near and dear to my heart. At um, our facility, we've been revamping our protocols because we found a lot of issues and misunderstandings, and we've had some patient harm and events, and we've had to reevaluate our process and guidelines to prevent patient harm because there were physicians and it probably is an old practice where they'll give a, a smaller dose IV push and the theory is well it's a smaller dose 
So Ivy Push is okay. <laughs> we want it in there fast. No, you want it consistent. If you if those IM injections aren't working, you want a very low 5 to 15 for adults, micrograms per minute. And you can't get that type of control from an IV push, even if you're putting a half a milligram in 10 ml syringe. And you really, I have to remind our listeners out there, we're talking about making our protocols safer. So if your protocols don't already have these adjustments in there, um, do not violate your protocols, but go to your medical director um, put them in touch with Amanda or whatever pharma, pharma, pharmacy resource that you have in your system, and which you probably don't have. We've already had that discussion. Um, but you need to bring it to someone's attention. We're not telling you to just go ahead and violate protocol out there because you, you do have the requirement in your job to follow your protocols. But you can find errors in your protocols and get them amended. And so read your protocols, look over what it says about anaphylaxis, and then you know, put, your, put your people in touch with Amanda and, and she can come in and do a complete pharmacology review of your protocols for you. Um, and that's what you, you're, you're doing such a great job at in Central Florida area. And I know there are other regions out there that, that need the same thing. So where can people find, um, just so while we're talking about it, where can people find you online if they want to look for what you're doing? I'm at www.pharmacologyconsultingservices.com. I have also a Facebook link. You can look for me on LinkedIn, Amanda Lent. Um, so I'm out there. My phone number, if you want to call me or text me, 352-256-4242. Um, it's about working together. So like, like Jamie said, you go to your director, say there are these issues. The more educated we all are, the more disciplines we have involved looking at it, we look at things differently. Because apparently this has been going on for a very long time, and it's become second nature and a habit, and it's the standard of care for emergency physicians and that's not necessarily producing the best patient outcomes. So it's all about working together, looking at it, coming together to find the best way to treat our patients, give them the most appropriate care quickly so we can get the best patient outcomes. Because EMS services are rated on patient outcomes. So if we don't start at the beginning when they are they call 911 and they're picked up and the treatment starts there, through the whole system, if we don't start them out properly, their outcomes may be bad to begin with because the right medications weren't given in the first five, ten minutes of treatment on scene, to, on scene time. And we're not calling out EMS people no. alone on this because, as you said, this is a problem with, with uh, emergency departments. Um, physicians are still doing this because it appeared in, in guidelines long ago and they've just never forgotten it. Um, but we need to really get out there and say that there are appropriate ways to do this. First, early epinephrine for moderate to severe um, uh, allergic reactions leading to anaphylaxis. Um, and then um, follow your protocols if you're allowed to set up drips after, an, after initial treatment with epinephrine in your multiple doses, then you can go to drips if you're allowed to, or um, call ahead to the hospital and maybe they can have a drip ready to go. Um, you just need to appropriately communicate with your team. Uh, and that starts ahead of time, like you said, Amanda, get the protocols right to begin with so that these things can be written in there and adjusted appropriately. Right. Medicine is called practicing because we're never ever actually really good at it. It's always changing, evolving, we're learning more things. I just read an article where beta blockers may not be the best thing post MI because the thrombolytic therapies have changed so we're reassessing that. We have to be willing to change and adjust and we have to keep up with the literature and all the new technology we have. I mean anticoagulants have come a long way in the last few years, antiplatelets. So we just have to be keeping up with what's going on in the, in the field of medicine. It's always a practice. It's never perfect. And we just have to change and evolve and set people up for success. So that's, that's what this is all about. Well, Amanda, I want to thank you for coming on. And uh, hopefully this is, again, uh, more of a continuing series we're going to be doing here on the MedicCast about pharmacology and how appropriately to use our medications in EMS and get our protocols on track with what best practices are out there in the rest of medicine. So, Amanda, thanks a lot, and we'll look forward to having you back soon. Thank you very much.